That's not a knife, this is a knife. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So, um, as you know, if you watch this channel regularly, that I talk a lot about uh, weapons of all sorts, particularly um, edged and bladed weapons, knives and swords and things like that. And uh, that's clearly what this is. Now, how many of you can guess what this is? Well, if you're not sure, so you'll either know or you won't know, basically, but there are some clues to guess. And one of those is uh, the fact that this is a short and very stout sword. We could call it a short sword. It is very thick, very thick blade section. It's very heavily built. Look at the size of that guard. Very, very thick and chunky and heavy. It's a full width tang front to back. So the tang is the same shape as the grip. The grip scales are riveted on either side. They seem to be made of uh, wood, I think. Could be horn, but I think they're wood. Um, and one, uh, two peculiar features you should note. So if you want to learn about identifying uh, swords that you might be unfamiliar with, two things. Number one, look at the shape of the tip. The shape of this tip tells you things. Uh, now, whilst the shape of this tip might be similar to certain types of cavalry sword, like 1796 British uh, light and heavy ca cavalry swords, um, and indeed sim similar in some way to certain, um, uh, you know, things like machete as well, but also similar to some swords like uh, katanas. All of those things have something in common, and that is cutting, basically, chopping and cutting. This is not a point which is very conducive to thrusting. Yes, you can jab it into someone, but it's not really optimized for that. It has what we call an asymmetrical point, that is the point is towards the back of the blade rather than in the center, which would be a spear point. Um, so it's not very good for thrusting and it's obviously a broad blade. It's just not, it's not really shaped, it's not designed for it. But there's another peculiar thing about this knife and that is its cross section. You might be thinking, Matt, what are you talking about? It looks like a completely normal cross section to me. It's it's got a big fuller and it's got an edge. What's unusual about that? Well, the unusual thing is if I flip it over and show you this side. Where's the fuller gone? Ta-da! Now you see it, now you don't. Now that is very, very particular and peculiar to one particular nation. Not to say you don't find it occasionally elsewhere, you do in fact, um, but in terms of 19th century swords, and in this case, short swords, um, this is a, a thing which is particularly beloved of the country Austria, or what was then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, because Austria had um, colonized and conquered um, Hungary and um, various surrounding areas. So the, there were various empires in 19th century Europe that everybody knows about the British Empire, uh, probably, and uh, perhaps you know about the French Empire, uh, but there was also the Spanish, the Portuguese, the, um, the Austro-Hungarian. Um, so various imperial nations, the Russians of course as well, various imperial nations in the 19th century taking part in um, in trying to be top dog basically um, in different parts of the world at different times. But the Austro-Hungarian Empire wasn't uh, wasn't enormous um, and certainly didn't spread really very much outside of Central Europe but uh, it was very powerful, um, very important and of course it was very important in the politics of, of Europe as well. Anyway they had their own distinct weapons and that's very important to note is that in the 19th century the way that you designed weapons was politicized it was uh, it was associated with national identity um, historical prototypes and all sorts. And this even goes through, as I've uh, mentioned in previous videos, into the helmets of World War I, the way that certain different nations adopted different styles of helmets because they were associated with their sense of national identity or particular periods that they took pride in from history or whatever. Um, so this knife does look passingly like a medieval messer, doesn't it? I don't think anyone would disagree. Yes, there's, you know, there's one key difference, there's no nagel sticking out at the side but fundamentally it looks like a medieval messa doesn't it um, and that is no coincidence because of course when uh, people came to design uh, swords if you look in France for example they designed, uh, designed the so-called um, cabbage chopper or cabbage cutter uh, which looks like a Roman gladius because in uh, Napoleon's empire they liked to allude to uh, Roman imperial uh, symbology and glory whereas the Austro-Hungarians they went back and looked at their medieval history and thought well we want things that look reminiscent 
of what our ancestors were using and they in this case associated with the medieval mesa it seems i don't think it can be any coincidence that this thing looks like this but what is it well it's a model 1853 later revised i think in 89 but anyway it's the model 1853 um, now, I'm going to butcher the German word here, Faschenmesser, I think is how the German uh, or Austrian uh, would call it, um, the German language would call it a Faschenmesser, but basically it means Fascine knife. Uh, in other words, a uh, pioneer's sword, and that's what we would call it in English, we would call it the Austrian Model 1853 Pioneer's Sword. Um, now, you will notice that it does not have a saw edge. Very often Pioneer swords have saw edges on the back. This version doesn't. Uh, of course, the cabbage chopper doesn't either. What these are predominantly used for are as tools. And for that reason, it is massively um, overbuilt, I should say. So if you're thinking about something that's a, a messer indeed, or a weapon, uh, or a short sword, that is not like this. This thing handles a bit like a club hammer, but with an edge on it. Now, I should point out, this example has never been sharpened, which would indicate that it was never issued, probably. Um, it's made by a company called uh, Striburn, I think it says. Um, but I need to research that. This is a new acquisition. It does also have a hel helmet on it, which might be Kirschbaum made. Now, a lot of weapons in the Austro-Hungarian Empire were actually imported from uh, Germany, well, what later became Germany, uh, from Solingham. Um, so, you know, there was a free trade in weapons from Solingen to everywhere else in the world, everywhere from the Sudan to uh, Poland and Russia to South America to England. So um, the Solingen uh, blade trade was huge. But this is a very, very robustly made uh, pioneer's knife. And um, I think that this is a good uh, candidate to enter into my playlist of um, little known weapons, should we call it for now. So the, the name of this playlist is still being devised. I've thrown it open to my uh, patrons on Patreon uh, to give me suggestions on there, but you're welcome to give suggestions under here as well. Um, and this is gonna be an example of uh, what I consider a little known, although it was probably quite well known in the middle of the 19th century, but a relatively little known weapon by most people today. It's the Austrian Model 1853 Pioneer. Sword. Um, now, I should reiterate once more, I really want to hammer this home, that this is like a hammer. This is a really heavy object that's predominantly for chopping up wood, clearing areas for gun emplacements. It is, it is a tool. It can be used as a weapon, and the fact that it has this guard on it obviously makes it look like a weapon more than a machete. It's not like a machete. Machetes have thin blades. This is a very thick blade. So this can double up as a as a hatchet, as an axe, uh, potentially you could even use the back uh, to hammer something in. Um, the whole hilt is incredibly robust as well, um, so you could potentially smash things with the back end of it also if you need to. Um, so it's really a tool that at a push could be used as a weapon. Now what I'm going to show next is an unidentified not flying, but an unidentified object. And on the surface of it, let's grab it down here, on the surface of it, it does look similar to this pioneer's knife. Ta-da! It's a similar length. It's got similar attributes and characteristics. It has a broad chopping blade. It has a guard. It has a hilt that's a full width tang and a knife like construction but it's incredibly different in the hand. These two things almost couldn't be more different. And that comes down to one basic fact. Whereas this pioneer's sword is incredibly thick and heavy, this, whatever it is, um, is incredibly thin. Uh, so I can flex it like that. Now this is basically like a machete, but it differs from a machete in some very, very critical ways. First of all, let's look at the hilt. So the grip is actually very, very similar to a machete, even down to the hook design at the end here, which you do find on quite a lot of machetes going all the way back to the 19th century. The construction is a full width uh, tang riveted on wooden scales, checkered. So very, very uh, similar to machete uh, grips. I will talk a little bit more about that specific uh, pommel um, hook in a second. 
but it differs from the machete in uh, two, and it's also got a very thin blade like a machete, but it differs from a machete in two very, very important and critical ways that tell us something about what this was, what it was intended to be, and how it was intended to be potentially used. Number one, and very, very important, is the guard. Generally speaking, you don't need a guard on a machete unless you're aiming to use it uh, as a thrusting implement for some reason. Usually thrusting implements are used as weapons, but I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, or or uh, to keep your hand from riding up onto the blade. So usually a machete has a, a projection purely to stop your hand from coming up onto the blade uh, in handling. But generally speaking, guards like this are not important on machetes, not put on machetes. So that guard suggests that this is at least partially intended to be a weapon and not just a tool. So not only does this guard indicate that this is at least partially, perhaps even uh, entirely intended to be used as a weapon, the, also the form of the guard as well. If you can look, it's almost like a cross between a shell or bowl guard and uh, an S guard. It's not just simply a bar. It is a, a great big dish, which actually provides, if you hold it point on, quite a fair amount of protection, particularly from uh, thrusts coming down uh, the blade if you're using it as a weapon. But the other big giveaway with this is you know what machetes look like. That's not what machete points normally look like. Now, indeed, you could have a machete which is a bit more pointed than normal, and uh, if we look at ethnographic weapons, there are certainly in some parts of the world, Philippines and elsewhere, um, there are types of um, large knife or short sword which are used primarily as bush knives and as tools, which do have points on them. But bear in mind that those are also the, the tools that are also intended to be used as weapons. So that point isn't necessarily making them better as tools, but it gives you the option of being able to thrust if you're also using it as a defensive weapon. And remember also that in a lot of parts of the world, we I think a lot of people watching this channel and even and me tend to fixate on weapons used against humans. And you have to bear in mind that in a lot of parts of the world, you don't want a weapon primarily to fight other humans. You want a weapon primarily to protect yourself from the wildlife. So, um, you know, if you're in the bush in parts of Africa or a lot of parts of Asia or South America, um, uh, and elsewhere, or even in the North Pole, then your primary purpose to having a weapon actually is to protect yourself from creatures, um, you know, types of bear and, and wolf and, and uh, big cats and, and all sorts. So, um, all potentially also in hunting as well. So if you're, if you're out there hunting for your food, uh, whether it be with a bow or a firearm, um, then very often your, your, uh, the animal you shoot uh, will need to be dispatched and um, a common way of dispatching animals is of course with a thrusting implement at close range once you've, um, once you've shot them and, and tracked them down. But anyway, I, I, I digress slightly. The point is that there's a point. Um, that is the point. Um, and so that really makes this different to a normal machete. It makes it very, di very different uh, to the normal considerations of a machete. So despite the fact that the construction of the grip and the, the thin flexible blade is like a machete, so think about places where machetes were used historically, that gives us maybe a clue to where this might be from, and there's other clues that I'll talk about in a second. The fact that it's got a point, a clipped point at the end, which looks like either kind of like a Disney pirate sword or actually more like a Langmesser from medieval Germany. Um, and the fact that it's got this type of very specific type of guard, which I don't remember ever seeing on a knife like this, means that this is a little bit more than normal intended to be optimized for if you get into a fight, this will be useful as well. And it is like a giant bowie knife. And actually, how much thickness do you need to a blade? If you're predominantly needing a machete and a weapon, actually combining the two things is a really, really good idea. You don't necessarily need a big, thick, heavy blade uh, like we've got on the, um, on the Pioneer's sword if you're not going to be splitting wood with it. If what you're mainly going to be doing is chopping through vines and chopping through forest and then occasionally having to fight a, a, a jaguar or, um, uh, or another person, um, then, uh, then indeed this is quite a good combination. It's like the combination of a large bowie knife, a very large bowie knife. It makes Crocodile Dundee's knife look rather small actually. Um, uh, with with the benefits of a machete. So very, very different to this, even if superficially they look similar. Now, 
The big reveal, where do I think this is from? Well, I think there's a few clues. The, the method of construction is very similar to machetes. Machetes in the 19th century were being, uh, a lot of them were being produced in Germany, in Solingen, um, and a lot were being produced in Britain and in bits of France and elsewhere as well, and exported all over the world. You could find them in Africa, in Asia, in South America, um, all over, okay? Usually places where you find thick forests, particularly rainforest, jungle, uh, things like this. But these were particularly, machetes and large knives of this machete-like construction were particularly being exported to South America. Now, there's a few other clues which make me think that this is South American or Middle American, okay? That hook, I said I'd come back to that. That hook at the pommel is found a lot on South American uh, machetes and knives. This seems to be something which is really, really common in South America and uh, the middle of America as well. Um, the northern part of the southern half of the uh, continent as it were. Also, the addition of guards onto things like this is also quite common in uh, parts of South America, uh, including, as, uh, and if we go up to middle America as well, Mexico, and the Bowie knife shape also was adopted, it was probably pretty much pioneered in um, uh, North America, but also in um, British exports to North America. Um, but this type of shape was adopted quite early on from about the 1850s uh, in Mexico and, and filtered right down into um, the rest of the southern half of the Americas. Um, so I think when we can buy, oh, and there's one other factor as well. In, uh, so we, we all know Bowie knives, and you know Bowie knives can be quite big, but if you look at Mexican Bowie knives, specifically Mexican 19th century Bowie knives, the Mexicans took the idea of the Bowie knife and made it bigger. <laughs> so um, it's funny because, you know, we make lots of uh, kind of like um, jokes and statements about how big your Bowie knife is and stuff like this, but actually, in the 19th century, it seems to have been the Mexicans that had the biggest ones, um, bigger than, you know, Texan ones. Uh, so uh, there was a tendency for large Bowie knives in um, Mexico and everything south of there. So my, uh, my, where I'd put my money as an antique dealer and, and dealing in these sort of things for many years and uh, collecting is that this is from somewhere in, in probably in South America, probably south uh, of uh, Mexico and Venezuela, could be, could be uh, somewhere like uh, Brazil, um, maybe, maybe as far as Argentina, um, where you do also find quite a lot of um, North American influenced things like Bowie knives um, and even certain styles of what their cowboys are wearing and stuff. But anyway, there we go. Um, so really, just to show you two types of utilitarian large knife that whilst on the surface they look kind of superficially like earlier uh, medieval messers um, or pot potentially even really big bowie knives are very very different to both those things uh, in a number of ways although this is more similar to a to a messer in fairness um, but they are utterly different to each other even though they look similar on the surface they are completely they just if you close your eyes they feel so completely different in the hand this is insanely light for what it looks like and this is insanely heavy for what it looks like the kind of opposite ends of the spectrum anyway I hope that's been interesting to you and um, I'm going to be looking at more uh, this is building on what I previously looked at with the Taiwanese uh, Lalau knife. I'm going to be looking at more forgotten and unusual and neglected weapons on this channel. So if you've got any particular suggestions that you'd like me to look at, then feel free to suggest away. And I'll see you really soon again for another video on Scholar Gladiatura channel. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.